Hello, hello, and welcome to today's episode of Saddest Night Out. My name is Roy, and I am the host of this daily podcast, and it's primarily about music and creative culture in London. And this is the part of the show when I tell you about my upcoming live shows, and I have two this month. The first is on Tuesday, the 17th of September, at Road Trip and the Workshop on Old Street. This is a show that I'm putting together. It's called Saddest Night Out Live, number four. And this is a monthly showcase when I put on some of the talent that has been featured on this podcast. On the next show, there will be music from Chris Gabriel, Lou, and myself as loads of Japanese bands. So that's Tuesday, 17th of September, at Road Trip and the Workshop on Old Street, free entry. The next show is on that same week, Sunday 22nd of September, at Paper Dress Vintage in Hackney. And that show is in support of the new album Ammonite from Its Own Animal. And then on that show, there'll be music from Juliet and Nanette, Delilah Black, and Its Own Animal, as well as myself as loads of Japanese bands. The, both of those shows are free entry, and these are the first two shows when I'll be playing Touch Wood with a full band behind me. So if any of you are able to come down and support, I'd really appreciate it, especially because with the shows I'm putting on, the more people that come, the more shows they'll let me put on, and the more voices from this podcast you'll be able to see and fully experience on my shows. If you go to facebook.com forward slash saddest night out, you can find more details there. On to today's episode. I have two guests with me, a lovely married couple by the names of Marie and Richard Webb Stevens. These are two incredibly talented performers who have been coming to my open mic nights on Fridays. And first I was struck by their talent, how well they play together. Also on the, I think the first time I saw them, but I'm not entirely sure... They played along with some of the other performers that we had, and they were fantastic at that as well. And then Richard was kind enough to show me his incredible tattoo of Jimi Hendrix on his arm, and I was sold. I knew there was a real story to be told here, and that's exactly what you are about to hear. I caught up with them both before my open mic at the King's Head last night. So this is me talking to Marie and Richard Webb Stevens, and I'll catch up with you a bit more afterwards. Enjoy. It's Friday night, so of course I'm at the King's Head and it's the quiet before the storm. The night hasn't started yet. I'm here with two guests that I am thrilled to get on the podcast because I've been wanting to for a very long time. Would you kindly introduce yourselves to the listeners? Cool. Um, I'm Richie. And I'm Marie. So what came first, making music or living in London? Clearly living in London. Oh, so have you lived in London all your life? Yes, I have. I've grown up here, lived here, and I'm still here. Always West London? More or less, yes. Um, I grew up in Queen's Park initially and then moved to North West London in Harrow. So when did music enter the picture then? Music entered the picture from very early on. My dad loved music, had the records on, grew up around music a lot. And then I was introduced to the piano from my mum who wanted us to kind of learn something. So my brother and I were going to piano lessons from a very young age. Did you like it at that age? I did, I did. Um, But I have to be honest, bunked a few lessons as you do. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and got found out and got into a lot of trouble but hey ho that's how it goes but still have a love of learning the piano um, and have played for church for weddings I'm not brilliant I make a lot of mistakes but people bear with me because that's how it goes it's life so how young were you when you first started around 10 younger than that um, I think around maybe 8 wow. or it could be 10 but it was primary school definitely primary school and how long did you stick with it until my teacher got ill Um, my teacher got ill she was an older lady old school didn't really like boys which is why my brother stopped going Um, but it's how it is it is what it is so there was a family (laughs) influence in like your taste in music there was music around the house and then it was your mum in particular who insisted on learning piano yes I'd say so and then from then on was music always a part of your life yeah I love music love to dance around love singing around the house all that kind of it's just and friends um 
didn't I'm not a raver so to speak but went to I remember going to a rave which was okay. <laughs> funny in itself was parent, one enough for you um, no I just remember a parent taking us it was back in the day where a parent had to take you it wasn't like going <laughs> on your own <laughs> um, and picked us up she didn't stay it wasn't okay. one of those kind of dropped you strict off. yeah dropped us off picked yeah. us up okay. but that was that was fun that was a lot right. of fun um, but what about making music? music I've not made my own music per se so I know a lot of people do their own writing of songs and developing of songs but there's just been singing along to other people's music and and have always loved had a love of singing I do love singing not the greatest but there's other lies people. all lies you're fantastic <laughs> thank you Roy pay you later um, but I mean that's always been a part of life growing up singing with your friends you know I'm not going to give away my age but the cassette players and recording music on the cassette players with the radio and singing along to that that's always been a fave thing lots of fun with that so when did you meet Richie? <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. a fun thing mm-hmm. no it was because I was at college and I got ill I get ill a lot <laughs> come on come on people um, but um, took a year out of college went um, very very hard working went and got a job at Charing Cross Hospital as a healthcare assistant first day there my mum said don't smile at anybody <laughs> and I smile at people I'm very welcoming smiled at this nurse because at the time Richie was um, working as a nurse training to be a nurse I should say just smiled across the ward while I was holding a baby and nature took its course that's all I'm going to say <laughs> so your mum said specifically don't smile at anyone yeah she said you're there to work this is strict Jamaican parents you're there to work don't smile at anyone and that's how it happened but then the person you smiled at <laughs> ended up being absolutely worth smiling for yeah wow. we're still together this is Aww. like years and years later <laughs> So, Richie, what, what brought you to that hospital? What's your story? Were you making music before you came to London? I, I was, and so I'm a little country boy from uh, Hertfordshire, a little village in uh, Hertfordshire called Chipperfield. I uh, grew up in a very musical family. So my granddad, uh, he used to play piano accordion when he was younger and organs, so I was always exposed to music. My dad's a guitarist. He's a, sort of a Shadows um, a fan, so he's always playing uh, note for note perfect. And I wasted my entire childhood and didn't pick up a guitar until I was uh, 16 years old. So what? the Blues Brothers decided they wanted to play uh, Sweet Home Chicago uh-huh. dad goes here you go son E, A, B, 7 off you go and that was it <laughs> but, history. it was but I was also born uh, to be a profoundly deaf in my high to mid frequencies so I've had hearing aids all my life um, I can't read music but I can play by ear ironically even though I can't hear but I always believe that you hear music with your heart and not your ears and they're just a little access route to get through but um, yeah 16 years old grabbed the guitar started doing school bands and then within a year we were doing um, uh, the back for the school plays doing a few gigs and then yeah moved to London at 18 and then uh, met Maria three months later on my first day on the uh, Plymouth Ward Charing Cross <laughs> and then um after that uh, I always have my guitar well, actually when I moved to nursing college from my flat I thought I won't take anything there and I moved there and then the day after I came back and humped my massive Marshall amplifier guitar and all my kit <laughs> on my own on the tube all the way to Charing Cross and uh, haven't looked back since so we've, I've lived in London since then obviously we got married uh, a few years later and stayed in London work in London and then I've been doing all sorts so I have written my own songs um, uh, bits and bobs I've been involved in lots of bands I'm a bit like a musical mercenary really I normally help a lot of people out and um, whether it's been helping out in a band to um, uh, play a gig or um, do some videos for them or bits and bobs but uh, yeah I love playing music guitar bass ukulele mandolin um, I'm not allowed to get any more guitars no more. <laughs> no. No, there's no room there's no space no more <laughs> So it seems like both of you, music had a pretty strong presence in your lives before you met yeah. each other. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you led fairly music adjacent lives. It hasn't completely left your life since. No, it hasn't, no. And, it, and it really kicked off probably about far, four or five years ago, uh, where um, uh, we had played together years ago when I used to go to church and play uh, with Marie, and then since then stopped. But um, I love making music with Marie. And what I started doing with a friend of mine was the little soirees at the stage door in um, uh, SC1, which is over the road from the station work. So we arranged a big open mic night where a couple of us would headline and do a big set and then we get all our friends to come along playing bits and bobs. And what I've really wanted to do, because Marie's got a fantastic voice, as I'm sure people can appreciate, yes, yes. and it is fantastic in church, but what I really like to do is uh, arrange songs that are 
traditionally sang by, say, uh, male rock stars, maybe, uh, or different variations, and then either playing them in a pop format or a funk format on an acoustic guitar uh, with Marie singing. So we started doing that for Soiree, did a few of those gigs, and they were really popular. And uh, it was just lovely, because obviously we get a chance to uh, spend special time together uh, at home rehearsing, and then also performing. And it's really magical, because that, that connection is really good. Yeah. And because um, I can't hear, uh, people tend to see me watching uh, playing. I tend to stare at Marie like this. <laughs> so uh, you, if you see all the videos, I'm staring at her like that. And it's because uh, half the time I can't hear what's going on per se. I can hear the wall of sound, but I'm struggling to follow. So um, I follow her lip pattern and think, OK, that's where we are with the song. And a lot of the time Marie starts conducting with her hands. And some of it's dance. But a lot of it's to me just to come down a bit, to come up a bit, which is Some lovely. Instruction. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So it's like having my own personal conductor, which is rather <laughs> handy. It's amazing. It's, not, it's yeah. like you've got a superpower, because I can imagine if you're good at listening and following along where music is going, mm. that skill is incredibly valuable for people who are making music. Someone who can pick it up. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, like I say, um, I don't hear particularly well in my ears, but you hear with your heart and soul when you listen to music. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think you've either got it or you haven't for some of that influence anyway. And uh, our, our, our team works really well. So. I heartily agree. When you two perform together at these open mics that we have here at the King's Head, I now I understand more the connection between you because you do watch intently. When I drum along with people, I'll also watch intently because... I, I got this sense from you, Richie, when you were playing. Marie, you're fantastic, and I very much feel you're the, when we're playing together, you're the star, and we're both in service of you. Own it. That spotlight is all yours. Drink it in. But I'm very much, whenever I'm playing with someone, I watch them closely because I'm not there to drum over them. I want to join in. I want to support. And the way you play guitar, Richie, I get that sense as well, that you're, you know what the song needs, and you give just what it needs. Not too much. You have the chops to go all the way if you wanted to but you have the that sense to yeah preserve it until it's necessary and then it's even more effective oh yeah yeah is that deliberate is that something you've worked on just natural how you play i guess so i mean because i've spent so much of my time playing with other people not just playing myself in my bedroom which is always good to do <laughs> with other people. yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is but the thing is when, when you're playing with other people uh, that um uh you know you, you're a team, aren't you? You're a band. You go as a journey. You go the journey together. And the idea is, okay, you all go and start the journey and finish the journey together. But throughout that journey, everyone's got a role. And you can't go steamrolling ahead. Otherwise, you end up on your own. And um, it just doesn't work. So, yeah, you, you, um, you, you have to pace yourself and you have to look around and, uh, in, you know, uh, encourage other people within the group you're playing with. And, um, yeah, it's not all about the individual, is it? Unless you're Jimi Hendrix, of course, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of his heroes. Jimi Hendrix is the man for, for Richie. He loves him. Um, the tattoo on his arm is testament to that, which is another story entirely. But here, there we go. When did you get that tattoo, by the way? So when, did you, when did you get that tattoo? About four, five, four, four or five years ago. Um, a friend of mine at work, because I'm a paramedic, I had a friend who worked in the control room, and she was a, always a phenomenal artist. So she would post pictures on Facebook of the Financial Times, and she'd uh, drawn a Financial Times, a portrait of Marilyn Monroe, whatever, in a bio. It was phenomenal. So um, anyway, she trained to be a tattoo artist, and as part of her portfolio, she had to do a series of different types of um, uh, tattoos to show her trade. And she put a, a GB out uh, on, uh, we call it general broadcast <laughs> in the ambulance service. Uh -huh. So you get this, uh, if you're on the ambulance, you get general broadcast, all mobile, channel 8, hold the academy, you'll have uh, emergency at Patton. So she did the same sort of thing, <laughs> but she did, um, uh, I'm doing this portfolio for my tattoo. I want someone who's um, bold enough to have a really big, colourful portrait of someone. So I was like, oh, I'll never get this. So I said, oh, Jimi Hendrix, dude. So um, she loved it. And her governor, who's uh, Andre, who had the uh, tattoo shop down in Kennington Lane, called Tattoo End. Um, so uh, uh, he was like, yeah, go for it. So uh, anyway, we searched a few pictures. I found one I liked, sent it to her. And I had it done in three sittings. So the first one was the outline of everything and the picture of the face. That was seven hours in one shot. And then two five-hour sittings. But um, it was good, though, because we're good mates. We've known each other for years. It was weird. It wasn't like you're going to a, um, a tattoo for the first time and had no conversation. We just sat there chatting for seven hours. The only part that was painful was the back of your tricep, which is just there. And that felt like she'd gone like that and dragged it down. But the rest of it was OK. I have to wake up and see this thing every morning. Every morning. It's on my side of the bed. I mean, he didn't think about that. It was just like, yeah, man, I'm getting Jimi Hendrix on my arm. Woo! 
but we have an afterthought. Oh, by the way, I mean, sorry about it. True, but what was truly amazing is, bless her, um, she didn't charge me for it. So we're talking 17 hours of work. People normally charge you know, 90, 100 pounds an hour or for a lump sum. And there's no way the family man I justify, oh, hi, babes, I'm going to squander half a month's wages on that. Um, <laughs> so it was the only way I could do it. And I was very fortunate in that sense. So. It does look amazing. Definitely worth it. Oh, yeah. Now, last time the two of you performed at my open mic, there was quite a VIP crowd that you brought with you. I understand it was a lot of family. <laughs> Have you passed I don't even on? The family that was there, that was our son. The rest oh. were just friends. <laughs> well, it's great, they're so supportive. But have you passed on your musical traits to your son? Is he picking up any instruments? Um, he did play guitar at school, and my other son played guitar at school, and um, our daughter tinkles on the keyboard, and they've all been commended for their music ability. Not that they're carrying this on at all, but they do like music, they like the blues, they like to listen to music, and they all like variations of music um, they're like us they like to sing in the shower and what have you but we'll see we leave it to them to mould themselves and to see what they'd like to carry on into their adulthood but deep down is there a sense of pride when you see that yes they're playing as well it's still going oh yeah yeah it is I mean I, when I was a late starter at 16 and I, um, I think uh, we're, we're not pushy parents and we've seen the results of you know pushy parents it works for some people but it doesn't work in the way we do things and we've seen the effects of our friends that have been pushed in directions don't really enjoy it and, and stop Whereas um, they've all dabbled and have an interest, and I just hope that they'll uh, take it up a bit later, maybe, and you know, feel the benefits of playing music and relaxing and creativeness. Yeah. Me too. Now, you mentioned Marie, you're not really working on your own music, but you are a fantastic performer here, and I imagine wherever you grace the stage, that audience is very lucky to have you. And Richie, you said you recently got back into writing. So where, where's your head at as far as creating new music? Sure. Well, basically, I've been making lots of excuses about work, uh, interrupting <laughs> things. That's why we haven't performed for about three so years. Busy. I am very yeah. busy. I am very busy. But um, uh, enough's enough, because I find it a really sort of cathartic, peaceful thing to do. If I'm a paramedic, you get to see all sorts of horrible stuff. But uh, you get to see life and death. But you also suddenly think, well, you know, don't waste your life. The amount of people we go to that sort of have an argument or uh, walk out the door or back thing, you know, next thing you know, we're going to the new one with us and they're dead. So um, that's how quick life is. So um, I've got, um, uh, I've always telling people um, not to waste their life. And I thought, well, rather than procrastinate my own, I'd start picking up the guitar again. So we kept meaning to do the open mic nights and we have. So it's been fantastic. But creatively, um, it's just having time, really. I mean, there's, there's a few songs I've, what's really annoying, I've written quite a few, well, not a lot of songs and I've recorded them and I can't play half of them now. So I'm sitting there, I'm learning my own songs. <laughs> now I've heard that some rock stars have done that but fair play to them they wrote there 20, 40 years ago they're doing their retirement pension they're trying to learn them again um, my songs some of them are only about five years old but I am starting to pick them up again so um, I think it's probably fairly normal so um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm back on an upward curve I've got a long way to go but, uh, Is there anywhere online for people to check it out or are you not at that stage oh, yeah, yet? Yeah, yeah I mean for years I had uh, um, uh, um, Wah Wah 999 really original because I love Jimi Hendrix and Wah Wah pedal and I'm 999 so Wah Wah 999 or even uh, just Google Richard Webb Stevens and uh, all sorts of stuff comes up there with my uh, YouTube channel with stuff I've done. Um, we also did a protest song at work a few years ago because good old Jeremy Hunt wanted to increase the um, retirement age for paramedics to 68. So uh, uh, a few of us got together and uh, wrote a protest song to the words of when I'm 64. We all donned uh, old people's masks and in ambulance uniforms and, and uh, we made a video. <laughs> and we made it in a studio in Crystal Palace. The white, the white piano, when you see it, was John Lennon's piano from uh, Abbey Road Studios. And the governor down there got fed up with everyone looking at it, so he gave it to Crystal Palace. But we wrote this protest song and um, I used the guitar I'm playing tonight and uh, it worked really, really well. But we're also worried because obviously we're in uniform writing a protest song. Hence we had the uh, masters who will not identify ourselves. And we released it on the Thursday, and then by uh, the Sunday, it had something like 3,000 hits, and it became really popular, not just once the ambulance service, but amongst the, uh, the uh, country. And I did the job, I was on the emergency call, and this ambulance crew came up, and I uh, knew them by face, but not by name. And he came up, and he goes, Oh, because everyone called me RWS. I go, RWS, good mate, we saw your protest video. That was brilliant, mate, well done. I thought I'm screwed now because <laughs> all they saw was my guitar yeah. but you'll see the guitar later it's quite distinctive after that I started getting emails from senior management oh, no. saying Richie that was the best protest video we've ever seen <laughs> Jeremy Hunt was supposed to come the following Tuesday and as a result of it he didn't because uh, oh, wow. 
well, partly because we were going to uh, we were going to hide around the station where an old people with masks playing the guitar. But uh, yeah, he hadn't he didn't visit because of that. So uh, well, it was I'm, good on you. Yeah, I was quite proud. Yes, yeah, small <laughs> steps. Forward. I've still got to wait another run six run forty five. So I've still got to wait another twenty three years before I can retire. So I've done twenty now, so I'm doing another twenty three. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for your time and sharing your story with me. I better go set up tonight's open yeah, mic, but I look forward, forward to it. Oh, as am I. And yeah, I'll catch up with you soon. You know, because you asked. Yes, for you. Please, for Roy. you, Marie. Oh, I will. Sweet, to play. Yes. <laughs> right. Thank you both very much. Amazing. Have a great night tonight. Thank you. And that was that. Thank you so much to Marie and Richard for your time. That was a wonderful conversation. And if you ever get the chance to see them perform, I highly recommend it. They did a couple of songs at last night's open mic. In fact, I should really start this part of the podcast with an apology because I promised Marie that I would play and bless her for insisting that I do perform as well. But I didn't perform last night. I know, shame on me. We had some other incredible performers that did play instead. And time wasn't on our side and I was more keen to let some of our other performers play than to take to the stage myself. But I, I'm sorry, Marie. I, I'd like to say next time I will play, but I don't know. I stepped away from the stage a little bit, but maybe with a little bit more encouragement or maybe just downright bullying, I might return to the open mic stage. But both Richard and Marie were fantastic. Richard has a 12-string electroacoustic Fender guitar that is a real sight to behold. I think I guess that's what he meant when he said he played it in the video for the protest song, and it was quite distinctive, so when someone saw that, they recognised that it was him. It's a really nice guitar. I f- in Marie, early days, parents insisting that you pick up an instrument. I think there's quite a few people I've had on this podcast who have a similar story from childhood where a parent insisted. It often seems to be piano lessons. I had the same. I also had a bit of an elder lady teach me, and I also might have bunked off a, a lesson or two, but don't tell my parents. But, yeah, she's such a well-rounded performer when she's singing. It makes sense that she did have some experience with it when she was younger. And even if she didn't continue the lessons, I feel as though an appreciation was planted and has really taken root and stayed with her ever since. And it's great to see that their kids are, in their own way, continuing the tradition, but also that the parents are respectful of whatever it is the kids want to do and are just there to encourage and support as best they can. I could have had that conversation for another hour, but I did have to rush off and set up the open mic. I think I started a bit late, but absolutely worth it for this conversation, as I'm sure you will agree. I'll put links to where you can find Richard's stuff online, as well as the tattoo shop he mentioned and the stage door venue that he talked about as well. As for me, I am recording this from Caffrey Studios. It's the weekend, so I'm holding down the fort which means I will be getting to work. I At my last rehearsal, I wrote out the notation for the bass parts of my songs, and it worked really well. So I'm going to be... I did that for some of my songs. I'll be finishing that for the rest of my songs for these sets, and then working on as many demos as I can with all of the loose ideas that I have on my laptop. So that's going to be my weekend, although I have another episode to post today from last night's open mic, so look... Keep an eye out for that, and I will hopefully be recording another episode tomorrow with Chris Gabriel, who, smooth segue here, is playing the next show that I'm putting on. That is Tuesday 17th of September at Road Trip and the Workshop on Old Street. Free entry, there'll be music from myself as loads of Japanese bands, as well as Lou and Chris Gabriel. And then Sunday 22nd of September at Paper Dress Vintage in Hackney, And there will be music from Juliet and Nanette, myself as loads of Japanese bands, Delilah Black and its own animal. Again, go to facebook.com forward slash saddest night out for more details. That's all from me on today's episode or on one of today's episodes. Thank you again to Richard and Marie for talking to me. Thank you all for listening. Feel free to reach out to me saddestnightout at gmail.com or saddestnightout on all social media. Take care of yourselves, folks, and I'll see you on the next episode.